Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Today, uh, we're going to be discussing um, the following. We're going to be talking about the technical subject area of the instructor PTS and specifically we're going to be covering task D, which is principles of flight. The lesson today, um, principles of flight, um, we, we're going to be using two uh, references. The first one is the airplane flying handbook, uh, FAA HA0833B, and the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge is the FAA hha 0 a three twenty five b. So the objective of the lesson is that you um, today get all the knowledge associated with the elements um, um, related to principle of flight, and these elements are the following: number one, the four forces of flight, airfoil design and characteristics. Airplane stability and controllability, turning tendencies, low factor in airplane design, ground effect, wind tip vortices, and precautions to be taken uh, when we see uh, wind tip vortices, right? Um, so the lesson is going to be a long lesson, like an hour, and then we'll take a break. Uh, it's an hour uh, because this uh, lesson is it has a lot of content that I don't, I don't expect we do during our um, private or commercial lessons all, all at once. And what I mean for this is that this knowledge contained in this lesson, it should be broken down in different small sections, right? Coming from the basic to the more complex as the student progresses. But since we need to cover a lot of topics and the evaluator might wants to understand if we handle these concepts properly, we are going to be doing the entire um, lesson based on the PTS. Uh, so um, if you guys have any questions, we can go into that and then I will assign homework. The equipment today for this lesson is going to be our Zoom. We don't have a whiteboard because we are not at the classroom. I have an aircraft model to illustrate some of the concepts. Typically, I bring a projector and a speaker, but today we're going to be doing this, um, how do you call, uh, via Zoom. And then my actions today for these lessons are going to be, you know, go over the objectives, objective, which we already did. I'm going to do the lecture. I'm going to answer your questions. And then I'm going to assign homework for the next lesson period. Uh, your action as a student is you should have come prepared for class. You need to participate, take notes, and respond questions, okay? So what is the completion standards for this? Well, the completion standards is that you should know all these uh, knowledge elements associated with the principles of flight, okay? Any questions? Okay, very cool. So before we start, I just want to ask you a question to the to the group here. Have, does anybody in the group knows why the F-117 um, was designed in such a way? So like very strange way. Okay, John? Okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. Answer, it was designed specifically to be a stealthy. And in order to be stealthy, it has a cert certain requirements that, um, you know, in terms of design, controllabil controllability, maneuverability, to fulfill that mission. As you can see, the airplane is like very straight, um, has a lot of straight profiles, or that when the ra radar wave comes, it will deflect them. Uh, but that's the, that's the main objective to be stealthy, but that requires that the engineers have to, to do a lot of things uh, to make this aircraft aerodynamically stable, including putting a computer to help with the flight controls. So you're going to say, well, 
they are Manolo, thanks for the introduction to this, but why this is relevant for me? What is, what is here for me? And what is here for you is that you're going to be a pilot and you're going to be flying different aircraft types during your career as a pilot. So, you know, if you start with a Cessna, eventually you might fly a 787, you wonder, you might fly in a Citation 10, right? So all these aircraft have different aerodynamic characteristics, controllability, maneuverability, they're going to, that they were designed or were established to fulfill an objective, right? A mission objective. So the more you know about these concepts, the better you're going to be prepared to understand how the air, this type of aircraft react, react as you move through your career. And then the second component is that it's a safety aspect, right? Because depending how these aircraft are designed, uh, yeah, then you will be facing um, different ways of how these aircraft perform, you know, or for example, how much um, the, the operational, what I call the operational framework of the aircraft, right? Like uh, O envelope. So, so as much as you know these, the better you know about aerodynamics, the better you will become a, a pilot, and more importantly, you will be a safer pilot. Okay, so that's what is here for you. I hope that is enough motivation to make you learn these concepts, right? Cool. Okay, so let's talk first about our first element, and uh, that element is four forces of flight. So for the four forces of flight, uh, I will do some drawing here to illustrate these concepts for you. And let me know if you see the screen. Let me bring this guy here. All right, cool. So hopefully you will see my screen and we're going to talk about um, the four forces of flight. So first we have um, an airplane here, right? It's not the most beautiful, but just kind of keep, um, let me delete all this, give me one sec. Let me start again. All right, so we have our aircraft, and these aircraft are subject to four forces. So does anybody know what these four forces are? Richard? Yes, the first force is lift. And lift, oh, you know, is behave opposite to the second one you mentioned, weight. Very good, weight. Then we have trust, right? And trust, we're going to explain how that works later, is the one that makes the airplane move forward. But based on the Newton laws, we know if we have a, a force going one way, we'll have another opposite force going the other way. And we call that other force drag, right? Drag. So any questions with these four, four forces? So we have thrust here, thrust. We have drag, lift, and weight. All right, so we're going to study all of them that you have a good, good understanding. All right, so the first thing we need to do when we talk about um, a wing or a lift is a win and why? Because remember, a wing, and we're going to cover this again later, is an airfoil. An airfoil generate lift um, using the airflow that goes through them. But then, and that's what we're going to cover now. So how they how they generate that lift, right? 
So, but the, before we get there, we need to understand what are the components of a wing. So the components of a wing, this is imagine this is the wing, correct? And you're going to say, well, Manolo, where that wing came from? Well, that wing is, just imagine, right? That I have my airplane, right? And I caught the wing here, right? I caught the wing here. And when you cut that wing there, that's going to give you a cross section of that wing. And that's what we're drawing, a cross section of the wing. So that cross section, right? You have this part is like bigger than here and go like that, right? So the wing has, right? This part here is what we call the leading edge. This is the trailing edge, right? The upper surface of the wing or the upper part of the wing, we are going to call the upper camber, camber. And the lower part is then the lower camber. Cool. Now, there is an imaginary line here that goes from the you know, leading edge all the way to the trailing edge. And I'm sorry, it's not straight. And that line is called the core. Okay, the core. Um, if we measure the distance of the core from the leading edge to the trailing edge, we're going to call that the core cord length. Okay? Core length. All right, any questions on that? Okay, cool. All right, so why this is important? All right, this is important because understanding that core uh, is going to help us define the next concept. And the next concept I want to cover is angle of attack. So angle of attack, and let me stop this again. Just imagine we're flying, right, in, in, in our airplane. And you can see here that the airplane is flying like that, and the wing is going to attack this wing, my, my finger is a wing, in different ways, depending on the configuration of the aircraft, right? So if the wing is, the airplane is like this way, right, it's going to, the wing is going to attack this wing in this way, but it might come climbing like that, and now I have a different, right, um, way how that wing, this wing is attacking the wind. So to avoid confusions, typically we call that wind relative wind. And it's relative wind because it's going to be relative to how it's attack, the wing is attacking that wind, right? So depending on the position of the wing, um, it's going to be relative to the wind. Uh, how how that is is measured. All right, so if we understand that concept, and then what is going to happen is how um, how um, how that relative wind. Let me put it here in red, right? So imagine this is the way like the relative wind is coming or then this here is going to be alpha. And you will see alpha a lot because in aer aerodynamics, you will see the alpha means for angle of attack. And in another way, you think about angle of attack is the angle how the wind is attacking that relative wind, right? So that angle of attack is a different or is the angle between the relative wind and the core of a wing. So let's define it like that and let's keep that um, um, that thought for a moment, right? Because we're going to use it a little bit later. Okay, now that we have covered angle of attack and the elements of a wing, we're going to cover how lift is created. created. And for that, we will need two um, physical principles. The first physical principle we're going to be using is one called the Bernoulli principle. And Bernoulli was a Swiss uh, mathematician phys physicist um, that realized that if you have 
a fluid, right? Going, let's call it like, no, that's not the best. Let me delete this. If you have a fluid, right? Right, going like this, this is called a venturi here. You have a fluid going this way, right? Passing through this narrow area and then leaving again. He realized that the speed in this area, the speed on this area decrease or the velocity decreases. And then he realized a correction increases. And then he realized that the pressure decreases. Now, as you can see here, uh, on this area, you can see this is a little bit similar to our wing, but opposite, right? So that's exactly what happened with our wing. So our wing is here again. Let me draw it that way. Right? We have our wing, and then you have air flow, and airflow acts like a liquid, right? So it will come, and then it will meet this wing. The airflow going over the wind, it will have a higher air speed or air speed or velocity than the wind going or airflow going under the wind, right? So this, as explained by Bernoulli, then is going to create our first component of lift, right? Or our lift first or the majority of the lift, right? That, because what is happening here, you have a lower pressure here, higher pressure, then the wind will raise. But that's not the only physical factor affecting lift or creating lift. That's where our friend Newton comes and Newton's on his third law says that for every force, you have another force acting opposite, right? On an opposite way. So what happened is this airflow, when it hits the wind, right? And I, you know, draw it a little bit here. When that air, airflow hit the bottom of the wing, it's going to get deflected downward. And when it get deflected downward, then, right? This downward is going to create a force like that down. Then using the third law of um, Newton, that is going to, create an opposite force that in, in this case is lift as well. So as you can see, right, we have these two, comp these two principles working at the same time to generate lift. So any questions on that? All right. Um, all right, so we're going to cover one another uh, uh, aspect of lift that is important and we're going to be using through these lessons and your entire life as a pilot. Let me uh, erase this Venturi here. All right. So what we have talked so far is Just imagine we have our wing like that now, right? We have talked about the air that is going over the wing and is creating that low pressure. We have talked about the, wing, the air flow that is going below the wing and is going downward and is creating the other component of leaf. But there is another thing that happened here at the wing tip. This is the wing tip of the wing. This is the root of the wing. This is with tip. So assume that this is how the aircraft is flying, right? So what is going to happen is this um, high pressure air is going to move up on the wing tip on the top of the wing. And then what is going to happen, that's going to create a circular or a vortex that is going to stand back and it's going to be growing back, right? That vortex, we're going to be studying it later, but I just want to understand where it comes from, is 
is that high pressure moving from the bottom of the wing over the wing tip and then um, being pushed back in a vortex. Um, this is important because we're going to see this on um, vortex um, on wake turbulence and we're going to see this as well on ground effect and then we're going to see this on induced drag. But hold the thought on this, understand that you have these three things happening at the same time, right? You have leaf generated on the top due to the low pressure. You have downward pressure because that air, meeting the air, that's creating a reaction, reacting force. And then on top of that, you have this vortex being generated on the wing tip, okay? When you generate lift. All right, any questions on this? All right, cool. All right, so let me do a graph first and then using this graph, I will explain to you later what the concept of a stall is. So every wind have a coefficient of lift. We're not going to get into the detail of that. These are for uh, aeronautical engineers, uh, you know, aerospace engineer, whatever, but you can draw a graph that says, right, angle of attack, and then here you have your coefficient of lift. So typically, depending if the wind, I will do this simple graph, right? So let's assume this is zero, right? So some wings are going to be having this characteristic, right? So this coefficient of lift is going to increase, to increase, to increase to a certain point and then the leaf is going to stop or stop now it's going to start generating leaf and it's going to decrease or the leaf generation is going to decrease so that angle where this happened right the angle where this happened is called the critical angle of attack and every wing based on their design have a specific critical angle of attack, okay? So what happened is when we get to that point, after that point, we're not going to generate enough lift to uh, make the airplane fly. So that's how it looks to explain you the concept, but how it looks physically, all right, so how it looks physically, if I delete that graph, right, is, and why that graph is like that is, Let's say here is again my wing. All right, that's my wing. There's my core. And then relative wing, let's assume, is coming this way, right? Relative wing. So my angle of attack is low. Now, let's say I increase, for some reason, I'm flying a different profile now, right? And let me delete this because there's a problem with technology. I don't know where. All right, cool. Now the relative wind, right, is coming again here. As you can see now, this angle is greater than this angle. And let's assume this angle is beyond that critical angle of attack. So what is happening is that that air coming, right, is coming here, but instead of attached to the wing, it doesn't attach anymore and goes away. So then you cannot create that low pressure that is going to help us create lift, right? So um, then you will see that also a lot of turbulence or bubbling start um, um, moving here and so okay being created here so that's what happened that's what you see that people talk about detaching the airflow because once you get that critical and exceed that critical of an angle of attack what is going to happen is the air is not going to be able to generate that low pressure uh, because it's getting detached from the wind right and so that's what we call an install all right so i think we cover why we generate lift, how we love lift, and how we lost lift, 
and then the key elements of a win and including angle of attack. Any questions on that? All right, cool. Now we're going to talk about trust. So trust is in, is now that we understand leave, we can probably now also understand trust very fast. So imagine this is my prop, um, my prop, right? And if you imagine, and if you cut the prop, you cut a cross section of that prop, right? You will see that that prop is no other than another airfoil or another uh, an airfoil. So what is going to happen is as the prop moves this way, then, right, the air will come this way and it's going to do the same thing that a normal wind does. Now, the only difference is that instead of being like a, a leaf, uh, let me show you here. In best, instead of being a leaf that is going, you know, on top of the wing, like going up, now the leaf is going to be that way. So that propeller here is a, is a rotating wing. And what it's doing is, it's generating leaf, but the, because it's oriented in this way, it's generating leaf that, that way. So um, we'll see some other properties about that later. Uh, related with angle of attack of the prop and all that, but so far, I think that's the only concept I want you to take, is that blade is another airfoil, therefore, it generates lift. The only difference is developing in a different axis. Axis is, is moving forward. Okay, now let's talk about drag. All right, drag is drag is the resistance the aircraft have when it's flying right as i told you if you have thrust then you have an opposite force and that opposite force is drag so drag is made of or is, is made of two components right two components we have induced drag and we have parasite drag para side drag. Now, um, induced drag um, is the byproduct of lift. And that's what I spent some time earlier explaining you why we have these vortex generators, right? Um, we have this vortex, a vortex uh, on the wing because these vortex are no other than the physical manifestation of drag, I mean, uh, lift. So what happened is um, these, dra these, these uh, vortices, right, um, that are creating, um, they create, in the, um, in, they create increase, uh, they produce drag. And the way they produce drag is just imagine um, is that the force that they create when they leave the wing uh, is like they're m just imagine they're moving a little bit backward the leaf component and the va this variant here is what we call drag right so that induced drag so just imagine that they are like when the airplane is moving it's like they're moving the leaf a little bit backward the vector backward and that is um, induced drag right. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of things later, how that can be reduced. Now, I will tell you that as you increase that angle of attack, um, more and more, the induced drag is going to increase. So if we have a graph here, right, where we have drag and we have um, a speed, you will see that as we increase angle of attack, what's going to happen, the aircraft is going to reduce the speed. And as we increase angle of attack, reduce the speed, we're going to be creating these vortices or vortex. They're going to be higher. And if they're higher, we're going to have more induced drag. So if you have that understanding, then you can say, or you will see that induced drag behave this way. 
So you will have a higher induced drag when you have a slower speed, right? And a lower induced drag when you have higher speed. And all that is predicated by the fact that higher the angle of attack, the more induced drag, the more lift you're going to produce, the more induced drag you're going to create because these vortex are being larger. The lower the angle of attack, the faster the speed, the lower, uh, the less induced drag you're going to create, the smaller these, or, or you have a smaller vortex that, um, have a, um, how do you go? Makes, um, have less induced drag, okay? So just for, for simplicity, think that to generate lift, you need to pay a, a price for that lift, and the price for that lift is what we call induced drag, and induced drag is mainly driven by this vortex. That's a, you know, simplification of that. Um, all right, so we cover one, and then we have the other one that is parasite drag. And so parasite drag is um, easy to understand because that's the resistance, the objects on the airplane, um, you know, um, or, or, or the resistance for some of the objects in the airplane that we, that they, okay, let me, let me organize my thought. So parasite, black, parasite drag is the, is the resistance that, you know, the aircraft suffer when it's in the airflow. And there are three types of them, right? Form, we're going to have skin friction drag and then interference drag. So form, just imagine that we have our landing gear here, right? Uh, so when the air comes here, right? The landing gear, not the fairing, then all these on the back, is creating drag, right? And is creating what we call form drag. Now, the screen fiction drag, it is a little bit more of a, um, what we call microscopic issue because you can see like surface of an airplane and this is produced by like the rivets, you know, imperfections on the surface. But even if you can have like a very nicely polished surface, but when you analyze it under a microscope, you will still see that there is a lot of roughness on that surface. So what's going to happen is that when the air pass right through that surface, right, let's say it's coming like this, small, that roughness on the surface at the microscopic level is going to create you know, some bubbling or burbling around that surface and that create uh, induced drag. Now, how you avoid that induced drag? Well, um, what you need to do is, um, right. so what you need to do is kind of polish it, right? So polish, polishing will help, but it will, it will not eliminate that. On the case of the form, the way to eliminate that is a streamlining the surfaces that oppose form, um, how do you call it? Form parasitic drag. And then last but not least is interference. And interference happens, interference drag happens because when you see, when the wind join the fuselage and all that, that might create a, it's a combination of either the form or a skin. And the best way is just to cover that with things like a fairing or, you know, doing an STC, like the people put like areas below the aileron and flap that the air, you know, pass smoothly. Um, so it's kind of a streamlined version of well. So why this is important? Well, parasite drag is behave opposite. When you add this three type of parasite drag as a whole, just to simplify this is, so you will see that it will increase with the speed. So the higher a speed you have, right, the more parasite drag you're going to have. So now there is a point here on this curve, right, where these two type of drags meet, and, and that's what I want to uh, cover uh, before we move to weight, is this point here, this point here, is the point where you have 
the most lift with the least drag. Now, why this is important? This is important because there are times in our life as a pilot that we need to consider to glide because we can have an engine failure, right? On a single engine. So in a single engine airplane, um, we're going to have, like in the Cessna, we're going to be flying, we're going to have a best flight speed. And that best flight speed is not other than this a speed where you get the maximum lift with the minimum drag and typically on the Cessna 172 that is around 65 knots we're going to cover that later but this is important now the other thing is I want to introduce you to this curve and I'm not going to go over these concepts now is that later on we're going to understand how this impact our slow flying characteristics uh, when we cover the slow flight. So we're going to revisit this graph through our lessons, okay? That's what I want to start kind of getting you familiarized with this. Any questions with that? All right, cool. Well, last but not least, uh, our our friend Wade. Wade is an earth force, right? And I, I, I like to kind of illustrate this saying, this is a force. And the a mathematical definition of a force is mass multiplied by acceleration. So you just imagine that mass is all the things that we have a weight on the aircraft. That can be the aircraft weight by itself, right? We can have the people, fuel, oil, and bags. Now, what acceleration do you think is, is affecting this axis? Yes, you got it. So our weight is going to be our mass multiplied by gravity. Now, why this is important? Because there are two concepts that we need to understand. The first one is the drag, the center of gravity always on an aircraft, and we're going to cover that later, center of gravity is always aiming um, down and is driven by this weight. And then, the, um, then also that just that if the only way that if you cannot sustain a, that weight, right? So our wings have to be able to sustain the weight. And if they cannot sustain that weight, then two things are going to happen. We're going to start descending. Now, if we have more lift, right? than the weight, then we're going to start climbing. So we need to start thinking about how these things play all together, right? Um, when, when we do this, okay? Um, so any questions before we move to airfoil characteristics? No questions? Okay, cool. All right, so now we're going to talk about airfoil characteristics. This is the second element of the lesson. All right. Um, as I said before, we already understand the concept of airfoil. We introduced it when we were talking about the wing in the previous section. Now, the only thing I want to kind of uh, tell you is that there are different types of airfoils. Um, and you can have symmetrical and asymmetrical airfoil, right? So in the case we have been talking so far, we have an asymmetrical because why? Okay, you see that core. Now I have to go like that core. Let me do it again. All right, that core line right this is not the best wing so let's go like that it's called asymmetrical because you can see it's dividing this upper and lower they have different um, um shapes and areas right while asymmetrical it will be something like and if you have your you know core is the same all right all right so a case where you will see a symmetrical, for example, it could be the vertical stabilizer, right? Vertical stabilizer. Here, 
you will see uh, asymm uh, asymmetrical. This is asymmetrical. This is symmetrical. You will see the asymmetrical in things like the prop, right? The wing, we, we saw that. Also, um, ailerons can have that and flaps. And we're going to cover that, um, all this later, but I just want that you make a note of that part, okay? Okay, cool. Now, let me talk about the three type of wings that you will see generally, okay? So, we can have, this is what we'll call a rectangular wing, rectangular wing. Then you will have something like this, this will be an elliptical wing, and then you will have something like that swept, or they call it sweep back, right? Swept, so swept wing. So again, we talk about this is where the wing attaches the fuselage. This is the root, right? The root. We call that the root, and we call this the Wing tip, right? Wing tip, wing tip. So the, the thing I just want to kind of es uh, explain here is how these configurations kind of affect drag and um, how designers, when they design these type of wings, affect drag and uh, lift. So for example, the first thing we, I want to cover here is we call it aspect ratio. So aspect ratio is, in a very simplified way, is the area of the wind divided by the windspan. So for example, in this case, this is the windspan, and all this is the area. So with aspect ratio, um, what they are trying to do is the higher the aspect ratio is, right, the higher the leaf, the lower the drag. And give me an example. Somebody can give me an example of a high aspect ratio wing? Yeah, absolutely. The freaking sailplanes are like super long, right? So that have high aspect ratio wing, I mean high aspect ratio. So these wings generate more lift and less drag. That's what they use in a sailplane, right? Um, like for example, a low aspect ratio wing is probably a, a fighter. They are making a chore and very um, kind of tight, right? Because they want to they want to make them fly fast, or they have a different objective. That's one. The other component I want to talk about tape taper ratio. And taper ratio is remember we talk about core length. Okay, so the core length, the core length at the root is this, right? from the leading edge to the trailing edge, right? And then here at the wing tip, this is now the leading edge and this is the trailing edge. So you can see here, this um, core at the wing tip is smaller than the core at the root. So the taper ratio is no other than the um, core at the, um, the core um, length at the, at the, at the wing tip divided by the core at the root. And I think here, the only thing I want that you take away from this is that, you know, the lower the taper ratio is, the higher is going to be the lift and the lower is going to be the drag, right? So as you can see, now designers have two variables to play um, with drag and speed, right? So for example, this wing uh, is a combination of, clearly it's not rectangular, right? Um, but it's made to fly fast, like the swept wing, right? So they're making to make flash. There, there is a body of knowledge why that is happening that we're, I'm not going to introduce that to you because, but they're made to do 
subsonic fly, right? Like jets, like a 787. All these aircraft, you will see that they have this sweat back, what, a sweat um, or sweep back wings, they call it. Um, but then they have, you know, some of the, these, these wings then have, you know, probably in this case, they will have probably low, low drag and they're designed to fly fast. Maybe this one has like more, they're probably designed to, you know, they're being designed to, to do training and things like that. But the point I want to make here quickly is this design, as I told you, and this is where we need to start getting more, more, more um, knowledgeable is how they're designed, they stall differently, right? So for example, and remember, um, that's where we have, you know, every airfoil have a different profile for stalling and they also stall differently, right? So in this case, for example, right, the rectangular wing is stalled from the back moving forward. So what happened with this is you still have some air going through the wing, outer part of the wing, and you get some controls over the ailerons or airflow over the ailerons that provide some controllability. Now, for example, the elliptical wings, right? They start move, it's tolling, you know, there's that air start detaching, right? From the back forward. While the swept wings start stalling from the wing tip moving through there, right? So here, for example, you can see that if you have the ailerons there, um, you know, you're going to lose some of the control and on the big jets, you are going to probably also lose a little bit of controllability, of course, depending on what speed you have, because these things have very complex wings and ailerons and flapperons and things. So I'm not going to get into that. Do you want to understand, understand the basic concept, like depending on the wing you're flying, the stall characteristics are going to be different, right? So this is important as you fly different aircraft types, you need to understand how that wind uh, is going to affect. Um, so why we have different type of wind? Well, you know, these wings, th just to make the story short, then everybody start flying these, then they start like making this more efficient. At the end, th they realize that, you know, if you want to fly faster and faster, these wings, the sweat wings were like the best suited, to, uh, you know, design, the better, the ones best suited to, to do this, right? The best, the best design. Um, all right, any questions with uh, the wings and the wing ratio, aspect ratio, taper ratio, and all that? Okay, cool. All right, another thing that you need to understand is the next element, is air per, air, uh, airplane uh, stability and controllability. So let's make a line here. So air, aircraft stability. So let me start with aircraft stability and we have two, two types of aircraft stability. There are two types of stabilities, right? Uh, we put one here and one here. And I'm going to put different, I will call this static, sta, static stability, stability. And I'm going to call this dynamic, dynamic stability. And, and then on the other side of the house, we will have a positive and we'll have a neutral. And we have a negative. Okay. So think about static. How I think about static is, I think about the instantaneous, instantaneous response. Intense. This is like a snapshot, like what happened immediately. So remember, what is aircraft stability? And let me start with that. I'm sorry, I didn't define that. So aircraft stability is a tendency an aircraft will have after you disturb them from equilibrium, correct? So let's say the aircraft is trim, and then for some reason you, let's say you push down, then the aircraft is going to have a, a, a aerodynamic or a response to that disturbance. So as I said, that stability can be the two types. It can be one that is instantaneous, 
or right there after you do the change, that's what we call a static, is initial response, right? And then you have a dynamic that is what happened, you know, with time. So I, I, I saw this on the FA manual and I think this is very good to understand the concept. So just imagine that you have, right? Something like this. That's not the best drawing ever. Let me do it this way better. And just imagine for a moment that you have something like this. Ah. Correct. And then you have a ball here. Correct. And then that ball, you're going to apply a force, right? Let's say you push it. Well, that is going to go eventually here, correct? But then it's going to come back here. So positive static stability is the one that when you, you know, let's say push the joke or, or move the joke forward, the aircraft will try to go back to the initial position. The neutral one, just imagine that we are like this, right? And then let me have our here again. And now we have our ball again here, right? This is position zero. And now we are going to apply a force to that ball and that ball is going to start moving. Now, assuming there is no inert, I mean, friction and all that, <laughs> what is going to happen, that ball eventually can keep moving that way, right? So in neutral, is, um, now relating that concept or example to an airplane, let's say I push, I push and now we keep the nose going down and the aircraft keep going down, right? The negative stability is, can be illustrated like this. Imagine that you are like clear enough that that ball can be in equilibrium here. And now you apply a force. That ball is going to come this way, right? And then what it's telling us is once that you affect that ball, it's going to keep getting away from the original position. <clears throat> so in, in the case, let's say in an aircraft, I push initially and now it's, no, it's like even getting worse, right? That's, that's negative static stability. But now that's only like in a second, right? Like I said, the snapshot. I think what is important that you guys understand is that the aircraft, that stability also have a component of time, right? So for example, just imagine that I have... Right? Um, so in a case that you can have a positive stability is I did the change, right? And did like this, did like this, did like this, did like this, and eventually go back to the original. That's what we call a dampen it of oscillation, dampen it. And this also will imply that this aircraft have positive static stability and you have positive dynamic stability, correct? All right, in the case of the neutral is that we affect it here, right? And now the thing keep doing the same, right? You see, it's not going back, but it's not aggravating or getting worse or getting better, it's keep doing the same, right? Now you can imagine and you can guess, and then, well, sorry, let me go back to this. This will require that these, it will mean that they have positive static stability, but they have neutral dynamic stability. Now we start right here, the displacement and this displacement start like going bigger, bigger, bigger. And then what it is, is initially it tries to recover, right? Therefore it have positive static stability, but in the, you know, through the time, then it, it has a negative, um, we call it negative, not to confuse, negative dynamic stability, okay? Stability. 
And let me delete this. Okay. Now, these concepts, correct, can be applied for all the three axes or axes that we have. So let's cover all of them. So as you remember, we have an aircraft move in three axes, right? So let's say this is my airplane like that, my wings, my tail is not the best, but this is my jaw, right? Because this is my uh, pitch and this is my roll. And then um, the roll is like called lateral axis, right? Lateral axis. And we have um, my roll is going to be, correction, correction, give me one second. I'm always confused this. Uh, the role is going to be our longitudinal longitudinal axis axis our uh, pitch right this pitch is going to be our lateral axis lateral and then our jaw is going to be um, Our jaw is going to be our vertical, right? Now, just hold, just, you know, trust me what I'm going to say. This is, I don't know why they confuse this, but let me, let's start talking about pitch first. And we know that pitch is related with what axis? We know is with the vertical, um, with the lateral axis, right? Well, they call these, and let me put these, when they're talking about stability on these axes, we call that the longitudinal stability. So the question is, what factors affect longitudinal stability? So, well, we have, we have two. One, the first one is the position, right, of the center of gravity in relation to the center of lift. And as um, and as we know, right, so if let's, let me do the three cases here. Let's say we have an aircraft and our center of lift is here and our center of gravity is forward, right? Then if the center of gravity is in front of the center of lift, right, this is center of gravity, then we say this aircraft it has positive static stability All right now if the air if the center of lift right is and the center of gravity are in the same place right cg then we'll say this aircraft have neutral static uh, stability now if the center of lift, if the CG is behind the center of lift, then we call this a negative static stability, static. So why this is important? Well, as we said, right, um, uh, let, me, let me do two things here, here quickly. So what I want also to say here is that so when the CG, right, in general, and we're going to see this when we talk about um, 
wait and balance when the CG is in front of the CL or this move forward, the aircraft tend to be more, more stable, right? On these, uh, more stable on these axis. And when the CG is behind of the CL or the CL, the CG is behind of the CL is less stable. And just that you understand these, I don't know if you saw the 747 in Kabul when it was taking off, it kind of, you know, this, all the CG move all the way aft, um, way, way aft, even after, you know, way, way, way back. And the aircraft was uncontrollable. And, um, and um, that's what we need to understand this. We're going to re, um, I study this concept when we see weight and balance, uh, but why I'm explaining you this is because the following. How we guarantee that an aircraft have um, um, longitudinal, longitudinal, longitudinal stability is that we can make an aircraft that it has both positive, static, stability and positive dynamic stability. And if we do that on an aircraft, then what we are going to do, right? Typically we're going, what is going to happen is we have our aircraft here, right? Center of gravity as I discussed is going to be forward of the center of lift. And then here you have your um, tail. So what is going to happen, right? Literally, that airflow is going to go over the wing. That is going to go over the elevator or the uh, st uh, vertical stabilizer. Horizontal, sorry, horizontal stabilizer. Um, and then the prop also is going to have a dashboard. It's going to make that we have a force down. That force down, right, is going to compensate um, Right, so the leaf right here is going to be a sum of, we have to, to contra or have to counterbalance this negative leaf produced by the force pushing the horizontal stabilizer and the negative leaf produced by the horizon stabilizer. Remember, the horizon stabilizer is also an airfoil, but it's an inverted one. So typically what happened is instead of generating leaf to the back, I mean to upward, it generate leaf back up, uh, downward. And so this is important because what is going to happen, let's just say for a moment that we law reduce the speed. So in that case, what is going to happen, and let me show you a, an image, probably that's going to be easier. All right, let me explain you here, but I don't have the image. Um, so what is going to happen is now we have less speed, right? So let me draw in my airplane here. Less speed. So the initial uh, vector for leaf here now is going to be less, right? If it's less, what is going to happen? This is like make it's going to make the nose to go down and when this makes the goes down now we're going to do what we're going to gain more speed and now if we gain more speed then the vector this is going to make again that vector right to kind of regain so what is going to happen is exactly what what explained you right it's going to be doing like this if they have positive uh, static stability and positive dynamic stability. But the main um, helper here is the downwash coming from the wing and the prop into the horizon stabilizer and the leaf, right? That the hor um, horizon stabilizer is doing. So this is how the airplane kind of, uh, you get stability on this axis as well. Okay. 
yeah, I can do a better illustration of this. I think what I'm going to do for next one, let me show you here. That's probably better. Let me show you my graph. So here exactly what I'm saying. So if you can see, let me make this bigger. Hi. Right. So here, what is happening is where you know the air is going over the flow over the wind. Some of that goes into the tail, and the prop also generate wind is going out over the tail. So all things equal are. You know everything is in equilibrium right so what happened now is we lower the speed right now there is less air here right um, so what is going to if we lower the speed right it's going to be less air here and uh, what is going to happen is the tail is going to All right, I will find a better way to explain this because clearly it's not coming along well on this graph either. All right, well, I will explain that. All right, let's talk about lateral stability. Okay, lateral stability um what we need to cover is you know the aircraft you don't want that the aircraft to um that if you have a little bit of gas it come back again to the original position and how we achieve that well we achieve that by um a couple of things All right, the first component of these we're going to call dihedral. Dihedral. And the dihedral is none other than, you know, some angle between, let's see, this is my airplane, right? So there, there is an angle between the root and the wing tip. So what happened is if we kind of you know, move the aircraft into one side, let's say we move it now to this side, right? Then, right, this wing here is going to generate more lift because what is happening is, is coming, the air now is coming in this way and this is going to have a higher angle of attack than this wind and then it's going to create a motion to this side, right? Regaining stability, that's the height, the hydral. Then the swept back, right? Is we already kind of covered that, but it's very similar to the dihedral, but is is um, it is um, have a less of an effect. Okay. Then um, the other thing I want to cover is the kill effect. In this kill effect, has. Um, uh, an impact on the lateral stability, but also in directional stability. And what the kill effect is, just imagine that it's like a the, the, the back part of a weather wind um, instrument. So what is going to happen is, let's say this is our aircraft, right? And our tail and our wind and all that. So what will happen is center of gravity is here, correct? So imagine the center of gravity is here. So what we saw, what we said before is that all this, you know, jaw and all that is going to be um, coming uh, on meeting on this, right? In this center of gravity. So let's say for a moment that the aircraft now, right? Comes and for some reason is doing a little bit of side slip for whatever reason you, you, you call, right? So now the relative wind is coming here and because this area behind and above the, the, 
the how do you call the um, behind the center of gravity is so large it will make move the airplane this way like a weather vane and then move the jaw so this is what i'm saying this help us with both lateral stability and directional stability because here the um, um vertical stabilizer also help right and then the last thing on i want to cover briefly on um lateral stability is way right so for example if you have more fuel in one wing it's going to affect that correct or if you have more weight on one part of the aircraft on the left side it's going to make the aircraft tilt to one wing all right cool then last but not least directional stability i think we kind of cover already the main driver of directional stability is going to be um the vertical stabilizer right you know like aircraft with bigger aircraft uh, bigger uh, uh, vertical stabilizer will be more uh, stable directionally stable but again as i said before you have the keel and the sweep back help um, you know maintaining this as well because um, really what is happening is these components we discussed before acts like a, the uh, like the back part of an arrow and then when we are a little bit joined that help join that help they help us reduce the yaw because what it's going to do is align with the relative wind right okay so any questions on stability all right cool all right so let me know if you want to take a break we have been uh, going for almost 35 minutes or if we want to cover low factor and then um, low factor and weight or um, oh, so I forgot to cover one thing here so last thing I want to cover is uh, maneuver maneuverability and maneuverability is um, is what I was telling you right like um, is an aircraft is going to be maneuverable based on the design characteristic the engineers put on that right so uh, it, it may be very maneuverable and doesn't have to do anything with the pilot but it's designed that way right and controllability is is the capacity the aircraft has to respond to the pilot's input right uh, so uh, um, so, so a good example is of this is the F-16, right? The F-16 was super maneuverable, super maneuverable. I mean, it was designed to be super maneuverable, but it was not designed to be controllable because it was not responding to the pilot's input. So the same with the F-117. So what they have to do is to put a, com a computer on the F-16 that kind of control make the aircraft controllable because it was no 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 but if it wasn't for that computer the aircraft was not going to be controllable by the pilot right uh so i think that's a, a way to explain that i hope you guys have understood that part okay so we're going to talk about uh turning tendencies and um there are four turning tendencies uh they should be very straightforward um I say turning tendencies. So we have the first one is um, torque. And what I like to do with torque is quickly show you this. Give me one sec. So torque is a reaction, right? It's the same what we, we talk about. Um, Newton third law. Uh, so just imagine we have this aircraft, right? So in a normal aircraft, um, the prop is in American airplanes, the prop is going to move this way, right? It's going to move that way. Now what happened is since it's 
that prop is grabbing air, right? It's grabbing air. You, you, uh, what it's going to do is whatever they move this way is going to have an opposite reaction, right? Because remember, it, even though it's, a, it's kind of a fluid, but the, the fact that that prop is grabbing air is going to make an opposite reaction to go to the way. So that's the torque, right? So if I let this, like, for example, if I grab that, imagine that my hand is the air and I grab and let it go a little bit, you see, it tends to go to the it tends to go to the left, right? So that's torque. So torque is none other than if we, if we see our airplane again from the front and we have our propeller and our propeller is going that way, correct? Then the airplane is going to react going that way, which is left, correct? All right, so Ah, sorry, I was not sharing that. So let me share that, okay? All right, so any questions about torque? All right, so we're we going to see torque. We're going to see torque during takeoff, right? So you, as soon as we apply, the aircraft is going to try to move to the left. So you need to apply right rudder to keep it center, okay? All right. So the second one is what we call slipstream. Slipstream. And a slipstream is also going to be a left turning tendency. And what it is, is just imagine that you have the aircraft like that, right? We have our prop here. So what happened is that the air, right, is going to come all the way, turning like that, turning like that, turning like that, and it's going to hit the horizon stabilizer from this side. And then again, for reaction and for rea uh, third law of Newton, what it's going to do, if, if it's hitting it this way, it's going to make it turn that way, right? So we're going to have a jaw on this way. So this is slipstream. Um, it's going to be, you know, again, all this might happen at the same time because you see, this one is going to happen when you have high power, correct, high power. And you have a high power where? When you're taking off, when you're climbing, correct? So again, you're going to have torque, you're going to have a slip trim. So again, here you need to apply for right, right rudder, right? Now for, let me, let me go to the third one and then we'll come to gyroscopic reaction. That's gyroscopic reaction okay, three. So last but not least is um, our, no, this is not last, but let's, let's talk about P factor, P factor. Okay, so as we saw, right, the prop, and let me paint this like this, and like that. All right, that's our prop, prop in the US, turn this way, right? Imagine this is coming like that, right? It's our pilot. Now on level flight, you will not have P factor. Why? Because look what happened. In level flight, remember these um, blades have an angle of attack uh, or by design, right? They are designed to have an angle of attack. So, or is, is all right, let's call it angle of incidence, how they have, they have an angle of incidence that they, how they attack the wing. Okay, the angle of incidence here, when you, when you have your cruise is the same on this side as the same on this side. But now, if you imagine that we're climbing, let me do now this on this side, right? Let me do...
you see when that prop is coming down on this side how it's configured and we're climbing you're going to have a higher angle of attack on this side than here and then what happened is having this higher angle of attack on this side is going to create more lift so if you see it from the top right let's say we're climbing this side is going to generate more lift and this greater lift is going to generate a jaw to the left right so so far you see you can see that we have three things in common here that we're going to see all these you will see all these three factors you will see when you're in high power and climbing why because climbing you have a higher angle of attack okay then there is another turning tendency and this is called um gyroscopic precision there you go Uh, precision or precision and this one is just imagine that when the prop the prop is you know turning so fast then it becomes a disc and since it become a disc it acquires the property of a gyros gyroscope so imagine that this is right the disc and then uh, typically what happened is that um, let's say we apply a force up like that, right? Then the, um, all right, so when the gyroscope is going, they have the force going that way, right? And let's say we apply this force here, then the resulting force is going to displace to this side creating a 90 degree. And now it moves from here to here, that's going to create a tendency to the left. So in this case, this happened a lot of the tail draggers, it's going to turn to the left. But in our case, if we're flying a, a three cycle, it's going to be uh, the opposite because what we're going to do is we're already um, kind of level, right? And now we're going to, to, to um, climb in um yeah let's just leave it like that i don't think let, let's explain that i mean if you ask me i will explain that in the three cycle you will go to the right um because you're already leveled and now you're applying the force uh from the bottom right you're applying the force from the bottom yeah that's it that's exactly what it is you're applying the, the force from the bottom and it's going that way, now move that way, and then you turn to the right. That's what it is. But um, all right. So this gyroscopic precision, you're going to see a lot more on the um, on when you're having a tail drag trail dragger. Why? Because when you're nose down and you pull forward, right? You pull forward to raise the back. Um, the back um, gear or wheel, what happened is you're acting this. Now that force that is here, because you're acting that force here, is going to move 90 degrees and it's going to move to the left. Now that doesn't mean that doesn't happen in our Cessna 172. It does happen, but it happens on the opposite, right? Because now we are taking off like that. Now the force, the, you see the disc is going that way. We apply the force up and then now that's going to displace to the other side that is 90 degree and now it's going to make a right the problem is that we have so much torque and we have so much uh slip stream and we have so much uh p factor that these on the you know three cycle airplane dry is going to get overwhelmed by or overcompensated by the other three forces right but definitely on a tail dragger you will see it when you're moving um, you know the nose down um, before takeoff, so you need to compensate for uh, right rudder as well. Okay, hopefully that was not too painful. All right, so let's talk about low factor. So low factor is. Um,
So log factor is the ratio of the total load an aircraft wing uh, support, right? So for example, so we have a load factor equal to three, that means that the aircraft can support three times the weight of the plane or the wing, right? Of the wing, wing. Of the yeah. Let's call it the plane, okay? So, um, and this is expressed in G's, right? So this is three G's, right? So um, you will have low uh, uh, positive low factor and negative low factor. Positive low factor are the ones that when you, for example, you pull the joke, that will be positive low factor. You're, you're subjecting the aircraft to a positive low factor. Let's say now you dive, you're subjecting the aircraft to a negative low factor, okay? Now, why this is essential for us? Well, two things. One, I will call it aircraft performance. and then in characteristics. Then two, right? <clears throat> then two is there is a relationship between a stall speeds and low factor. Okay, so these are very important. So let's go cover number one. So when the FAA uh, certify one of these aircraft, they certify to support this low factor, right? So, for example, in our Cessna 172, you, they, they're going to say, hey, you can do this type of maneuvers without violating this low factor. So what they're telling us is, hey, you can do this maneuver if without stressing the aircraft so much. And um, there are three types of categories that they certify that, right? So the first one is normal category and that means that the aircraft can is going to be rated to operate between 3.8 g's to minus 1.52 g's correct and then these typically will allow you to um, do non-acrobatic non-acrobatic maneuvers, right? And um, the aircraft is typically, is the weight is less than 12,500, right? Uh, pounds. Now, non-acrobatic maneuvers include any normal flying maneuver, and stalls and lazy eight chandelles and steep turns. With an angle less than 60 degrees. So, this category here, as you can see, is pretty much our kind of our Cessna 172, for example, on a normal category can do that. Now, now, 
let's say a utility. Look what happened with the utility category. They allow you to have more, more, um, the range of G's is bigger. So it's go from 4.4 G's positive to minus 176 G. Now, why they allow you to do that? Well, the only way that they allow you to do that, that we'll cover this in weight and balance, but the main reason is you have to have less weight on the aircraft, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that later, how you can determine which category, because an aircraft like a Cessna 172 can be operated in, under a utility category and can be operated on the normal category. So then all the time is normal, but so you can operate it as a utility. So now, um, the, the difference here is that, again, this is for aircraft less than 12,500 pounds. And here is going to allow to do, you know, all what we have done, but the only thing is we are going to do, allow us to do spins, right? Uh, spins. And then you have like the craziest uh, cause in the house is the acrobatic. They're designed to take more Gs and low factor and they can go from six Gs, right? To three Gs, minus three Gs, right? Um, so, um, so this is important, right? Because, I mean, you need to understand in what profile you are operating and what limits, you know, the FAA is approving this aircraft. So that's the first, the first thing is, you know, aircraft performance characteristics are designed by, um, are regulated by the FAA, and it has to fall in these three categories, right, for aircraft less than 12,500 and um, pounds. And then, um, and then the other thing that is important is that there is a relationship between low factors, as I say, and speed, right? So, um, and the, the relationship is the relationship is that when an aircraft turn, and we're going to cover that more on turn, right? Aircraft turn, right? Now, this vector of uh, resulting load is going to the aircraft to make um, heavier, or uh, it's going to weigh more. So that means now we need to generate more lift, right, to compensate for that. Um, added weight. Uh, so what happened is um, we need to understand that with this added weight, now our stalling speed is not going to be the same as we were fly and level, correct? So this is why people need to understand, and this is where we are going, I'm going to be like telling you day after day that when we're turning, we need to keep, you know, higher speeds because we can stall a higher speed when we're turning. And typically you will see, we will cover that later. And I think I have one case here to illustrate to you. So, for example, for the Cessna 172, you see, and nothing happened if you have an angle of attack, you know, less than, you know, let's say 30 degrees, right? So, we know that the unaccelerated stall speed for a um, Cessna 172 is 44 knots, but as you can see here, if I add bank, right, is 44, 44, here up to 30, we only add three knots to that stalling speed. But since we are adding low factor, right, because the turn, look now at 60, I have a low factor of two, two times the weight, right, now the aircraft is waiting more, I'm turning, now I have higher speed. Uh, so it's almost a 40% increase on the speed. Of course, if I go to 75, now it's almost close to 90, right? So um, this is a important part I want that we uh, cover today is that low factor, when you turn, low factor increases, and we know that when increase, low factor is more weight, 
and we know that the store stalling and speeds increase based on these uh, proportions, right? Okay, so that's what I want to talk briefly about, um, you know, um, low factor and um, the impact. Uh, one thing I want to talk about low factor as well is uh, that you're going to see this on the test and um, let me show you quickly, is the BJ graphic. So the BJ graphic is, um, is something that manufacturers put together and you're going to see it on the test. So here, for example, is you see you have low factor on these axis and then you have a speed, correct? So this is a speed that you're stalling in this case, right? They say normal speed, but you see these, um, um, let me see if I can, you see this line here, this let me make it bigger. All right, this line here, right here, this line here between point A and point B, point A to point B is if we are turning, right? Because remember, turn increase low factor, right? Then that's our accelerated speed. That is the um, graph we saw before, right? So now here you see uh, this is your normal range, all these in green. This is flight level, level flight at 1G. You're not uh, accelerating and accelerating. Then here, you see, this is very important. Um, B, this point between B and C is the upper or the positive limit load factor, right? So this is, uh, you don't want, let's say you're pushing up. Uh, or turning or whatever, you don't want to be exceeding in this case somewhere around four, four and a half, I would say, four and a half Gs, right? Which is similar, this is coming from uh, that table we saw before for utility and things like that, right? This is kind of what is providing you that envelope. Now, what happened here, if you go over that positive limit design, right? Um, if you go here, well, if you go here, because you aircraft is not designed to do that, you're going to have a structural damage, right? Now, if you go even go over that, right, then you're going to destroy the aircraft. You're going to, wings are going to come apart and all that, and we don't want that, right? So then, um, then this yellow part is going to be indicated on the speed indicator in the aircraft. That's like our caution in the, um, airspeed indicator, this is our maximum structural speed. And then red line is a never, the VNO, never exceed, a never exceed a speed here, right? Why? Because if we exceed it, again, we're going to have a structural failure, uh, never exceed VNE. Okay, then the same happened here, right? This is, you will be your negative as a letter stall speed, it will be this. Then here will be your negative, uh, uh, negative uh, low uh, limit low factor, and um, here this point here is a maneuvering speed, right? And maneuvering speed is a speed that you want to achieve, um, not to um, create damage to the aircraft, right? Um, structural damage. So you see, we're, we're going to be saying in this case, that is somewhere around, let's call it 130 miles per hour. And at that, you don't want to be putting the aircraft more than three, the four Gs, right? So if you keep the aircraft on that range, normal flight, and you will be able to go up to the upper limit without getting into, into trouble.
Okay. Okay, so I think we need to explain that BG better, but all right. Uh, so with that, uh, we will come now to um, uh, we'll talk briefly about Wintic Wint. Um, Uh, win tip portis again uh, it should take like a five minute conversation and then we'll we'll break for um, for how do you call break and finish the lesson okay so we cover um, before our wing tip vortices right we understood where they come from and just to recap again I will draw this wing right and then we have we know that we have air going over the wing that is cre creating the low pressure and then we know that we have air going below the wing that is creating our high pressure and we know that wind tip vortices are being created because this high pressure wants to go on the, to the low pressure on the top and then it creates this vortex that we before saw they were related with induce drag right they're the main reason of induced drag now i'm going to talk about one ground effect first since it's related to a concept and then we're going to talk about the risk about the weight turbulence and all that so the ground effect right so one thing that we're going to see about weight turbulence i mean this this these guys here is that Let's say we're flying, right? And these things are like going out, out, correct? And what happened? They're generating induced drag. We know that, right, from before, correct? All right, but now we're, when we're getting close to the ground, right? Close, and this, they imagine this is the ground, right? Now we're getting close to the ground. What happened? Look what happened. Well, let me do some landing gears here. Okay, so now we're close to the ground. We haven't touched down yet, but guess what happened? When this wind tip wants to go, it get destroyed here. It get destroyed. And because you get destroyed, right? Now it cannot go back and create induced drag. We know that because we already know that you know, these guys, the, the, um, the vortices are the main reason why we have induced drag. So what is going to happen is going to increase the efficiency of the, of the lift. It's not that you're creating more lift, you're not creating more lift, but you effectively, effectively what you have done is reduce drag. And now the aircraft is going to, they say, feel or perceive that it's flying better, in reality, what you have done is you have the same leaf, right, all the time, but now you have reduced that drag because that drag got destroyed when the wind tips get, or, or the vortices get uh, interfered by the ground. So that's ground effect. So don't use that concept like, oh, there's a caution of air. No, it's not caution of air. What has happened is you have, since you're close to the ground, you have destroyed the way or have um, not destroyed but have um, interfered with these um, with the uh, wind tip vortices and they cannot be generated and now you gain as you you now are being more efficient with the lift you have you always have had that lift the only thing is you were before it was being reduced by the vortices so remember that always remember that this is a physical explanation of ground effect, and that is that you are you have a perceived um, increase on leaf. It's not perceived increase in leaf. Is you have the same leaf. The only thing is now you don't have that induced drag that you used to have because the ground is interfering with the creation of vortices, the vortices creation. 
Now, that's a good segue for this, because if we know that the wake at the vortices are created or, or are stopped when we get close to the ground and definitely are totally stopped when we're on the ground, then that's, that's a good a way to start this conversation, right? So we know, correct, the reason why these vortices are. But these vortices are going to be dangerous. And they're going to be dangerous because they say if we have a, you know, like a 747 right here, and we have our Cessna 172 here, well, first of all, this aircraft is bigger, right? Let's say, and then the, the vortices are going to be massive. And if we get in one of these, it can literally turn the aircraft, right? Um, turn the aircraft away. So um, turn it around and we can have uh, an accident. So, um, so again, we, you can now gather, because we have studied this, that these, the nature of these vortices are going to be uh, related to the wind design, right? And uh, for example, an aircraft that has a wind tip might have a, um, a windlet, might reduce a little bit of this, but it still have it. Um, but what we know is what you need to be careful and let's, let's, let's take note of this is that for a fact, So what we're going to know is that you will see these are going to be worse, this wake turbulence, if the aircraft that is, especially a bigger airplane, if it's heavy, right? If it's clean and if it's slow, correct? So that's why when we're getting close to an approach and we're following one of these aircraft, right? We need to keep safe distances because what is going to happen is they go back for miles and of course, they will go down, correct? But we need to be, con and we, don't, we have to have separation. And ATC is going to provide separation if we're doing IFR, but if we're visual, it's, us, it's up to us to maintain that separation. Right? Um, so as I said, they generate when they uh, leave the ground and they end when they stop the ground. Um, what we need to kind of is understand how we can avoid it. And we, how we can avoid it is, let's say for takeoff, right? Takeoff, we need to say, let's say the aircraft that was taking off heavier took off here. So we know this wake turbulence is going to be here. So the only way to avoid that wake turbulence is that we need to be sure that we took before them. And probably it's also recommended that we turn because um, if we keep the same, we might um, anyway uh, meet them because our uh, performance um, might not, flying performance might still make us an encounter, right? So that's for takeoff. Um, for landing, right? Um, let's say we're behind one, we need to see where he touched down, right? If he touched down here, you know that they're going to be wake turbulence. So ideally, we need to touch down after them, right? Uh, if we're going to take off as well, um, and let's say we're waiting here for takeoff, right? And that thing is coming, we need to see where he touched down and be sure that we take off after that. Because if we take off before, we might encounter that wake turbulence. Right. And then we need to uh, also be sure that when you have intersecting runways and you're landing in this runway and how they're taking off, so you need to visualize what that wake is doing, right? And see how the wind is coming too. So all these we will cover with more detail uh, when we fly, um, but the idea is that you need to visualize the wake and avoid it. Um, 
you need to visualize if you're taking off where they took off, took off before them. Uh, ask for a delay if needed for takeoff. If you're taking off after aircraft landing, as I said, be sure that you take off uh, after where you touch down because remember the wake ends up there. And if you're landing again uh, behind them, you need to line af land after they touch down. And then, um, and now uh, if you're landing af one after takeoff, right, you're coming to land, be sure that you land before they take off as well. Um, if you're flying, let's say, and this guy cross you, just be sure that you're at the same altitude, right? Let's say you're coming this way uh, because they will go down. If you're below, you might get that wing, uh, um, that um, wake turbulence as well. And last but not least, um, be aware that the helicopters are also generated, generating um, wake turbulence, right? So you need to look for turbulence behind the helicopter as well. Okay, so hopefully, um, I know this was a heavy lesson. Uh, there is a lot of material here, um, but I want to, uh, as I said, we are going to start taking some of this material and target it based on our students. This, uh, because we're not going to jam all that, it will be inefficient, it will be not productive for them, but we need to have this knowledge for the instructor test. And so, but eventually, for example, I will have this wake turbulence. Maybe I'll talk to them before we start flying, right? Um, we, I will not probably cover in the, the low factor the same day. We will cover low factor before we start doing, you know, stalls and things like that. So um, the idea is that we need to break this um, uh, knowledge or elements of knowledge based on the uh, skill and ability of the students. So that's a disclaimer there because we don't want to be teaching all these to them at the same time. And I hope you understand this is a very important aspect of safety we covered today, like wake turbulence is very important. You need to understand when to take off, land after an aircraft. Uh, you need to understand, we also learned that if you, uh, depending on how you maneuver the aircraft and how many Gs you put, it's going to be affecting the safety and integrity of the aircraft. We need to be aware of what our limits are. We're going to be covering this more on weight and balance as well, because it's going to let us know when we're a utility or a normal category. Definitely, we're not going to be acrobat because we are not flying acrobat today on, in our course. We also learn about stalls, why stall happen. Um, and then, um, and we also learn how aircraft behave in terms of stability and maneuverability and control, controllability. So I hope, um, you know, this is very important, as I said, that you learn this. You're going to be learning this in every aircraft. You need to understand how the aircraft uh, is stable, how, you, uh, how controllable it is. And the more complex advanced aircraft, the more important that is going to be, because as I said earlier, these Airplanes are defined with different objectives in mind, and they're going to behave differently based on this objective or mission. So with that, I think this is um, the end. Let me know if you have any questions in terms of homework. Um, we're going to be for next uh, lesson, which is going to be weight and balance. This is what I want that you guys do. Let me um, tell you. Wait, my weight and balance lesson. All right, so for weight and balance, I want, let me share this quickly. I, you guys are going to be covering, you need to come prepare for the next lesson with the aircraft manual and the operating a handbook, you need to bring your E6B or your uh, flight calculator. Um, be sure to review again the weight and balance handbook. Uh, also review the airplane flying handbook and the P hack. I'm going to tell you what you need to do that specifically in a second. And then review and watch this video, okay? So I hope you have 
fun today and I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye.